Welcome to the Leading Nomics Show. And today we have with us Dr. Mark Faber, who is an investment guru, uh, former ski champion, uh, also a contrarian economist, and uh, an investment advisor. Mark, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you. Great to be. Great to have you here with us. Yes, thank Tell you. Us, My pleasure. How, how did you get to where you are? I mean, as a, as a, as a person who everybody listens to for advice on investments. Well, I was born in Switzerland. Mm -hmm and grew up there and then I finished university. I studied in Zurich and in uh, London at the LSE uh, Economics. And I didn't know what to do and uh, I thought about advertising and then I got a job with an investment bank because they were already then paying the most money. Yes, so, right. And they immediately sent me to New York. So I went to New York and yeah. in 73, uh, the firm I was working for wanted me to develop their business in Asia, that okay. was quite well. Yep. And so they sent me to Hong Kong, but before doing that, they asked me to go look around Asia, whether I liked it or not, mm. because they didn't want me to go for, to Asia for six months or one year, they wanted me to come here and really build the business. Right, right. So I came to Asia on this trip, and I went for a day to Tokyo, and then uh, for a day to Hong Kong, and then mm. for two weeks to Pattaya, and then I told them, yes, I like Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I am in Asia. Okay. <laughs> And, and so you've been in Asia for a long time. Uh, yes. Since 78, right? Since uh, 73. 73, yeah. Yes. Uh, and you started a business, uh, you, you actually worked for them for till 1990. Yes, for White Weld until 78, and okay. then White Weld was bought by Merrill Lynch. Okay. And I didn't want to work for Merrill Lynch. Okay. So then I opened the offices for Drexel Burnham Lambert. Okay. And in uh, 1990, they failed. Okay. And then I started my own business. Okay. Well, why did they fail? Well, basically, they had different businesses, but the most successful one was the junk bond business, in other words, high yield bonds. Yes, and they leveraged that up, and then they got involved in some insider trading cases. Okay. Not the firm, but an employee there, mm -hmm. Mike Milken. And then, uh, basically, we had the stock market crash in 87, and right. spreads widened and so forth. And the time came when uh, nobody wanted to lend the money anymore mm -hmm. because they had a huge position book of high yield bonds and yep. were financing it short term. In other words, they had already discovered then high leverage. And so they failed. It wasn't that the creditors didn't get paid. But I then took over the Hong Kong office and started my own business. I see. And you've been at your own business since then? Right? Yes. And, and you have a report that you call. Uh I have the Gloom, Boom and Doom report yep. and I have a website report and then I stayed in Hong Kong until year 2000 with my own business and I still have an office there. But after 2000 I noticed that I was actually working for the whole office. In other words, before I had employees that worked for me and then I started to work for my employees. That's right. And I also wanted to have a change in lifestyle because I was traveling more and more mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. I spend say three quarters to 80% of the time on airplanes. Yep. So when I'm not traveling, I like to be in an environment that is more quiet, mm -hmm. with some trees and dogs and uh, house and okay. office and so forth. So then I moved to Chiang Mai in year 2000. I still keep the office in Hong Kong. Okay, so you're back to Thailand. <laughs> uh, but but you were once a ski champion, right? I mean, you, yes, Swiss, correct. you, you were the Swiss national team, right? No, uh, yes, but uh, I wasn't Swiss national champion. And I never went to the Olympics, but okay. I went twice to the Students' Olympics. Okay. And I was in the students' national team for uh, five years. And, and why, why didn't you uh, go into sports full time? Well, it's also like I went to become a military pilot. I oh, didn't okay. succeed at the end. But you do certain things in yeah, life because yeah. at the right time, at That's the right place, you do certain things. That's right. I mean, I'm not going to win another ski race today at my age. <laughs> no, will I win a marathon? <laughs> So, you know, you do certain things when you're 20, right. and other things when you're 40, and other things when you're over 60. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're interesting because you, you actually ended up doing a PhD before the age of 24, right? Yes, yes. When you do a PhD, the most important is to choose a professor mm -hmm. and then choose a subject about which the professor doesn't know much. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to go and write right. about monetary policy with Milton Friedman, right. you know what I'm you want, So I chose a professor yeah. who was going to retire one year later. Okay. 
and I chose a subject uh, which was the financial reform of Robert Peel in England, okay. about which he had no clue. Okay. So I went to England to research that and then presented it in Switzerland. Okay. And because he was just about to retire, he, passed you. he <laughs> wasn't very keen to check on every small detail. <laughs> Okay, so so the advice here, I guess, is uh, if you are a PhD, you know, find an opportunity to. Uh yes, but I have to say to my credit, I was in the end tested, and I studied those under him, under Professor Huller, mm -hmm. and he supplied the theoretical background to the value-added tax because Germany was the first country to introduce a value-added mm -hmm. tax, and he had extensive uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it was very reputed worldwide mm -hmm. for his books, which was fiscal policy and financial policy. Mm -hmm. So I studied under him. I never understood what he was talking about, <laughs> but when I read the books, I understood a bit more. <laughs> and so you, you have rather interesting life. And, and now you're known as Dr. Du. Yes. yes. Uh, why, why is that? And, and tell us a bit about this whole contrary economy. Well, economics. basically, in... 82 to 87 we had a huge stock market boom mm -hmm. and markets became very overbought in 87 and yeah. partly also significantly overvalued and so I predicted the crash and as it happened within a week it happened yeah. and then I had a journalist in Hong Kong who started to call me Dr. Doom okay. because I started to predict that the Japanese stock market would be cut by 50% mm. And after 1989, when the market peaked out at uh, 39,000, it went down by more than 50%, by actually over 70%. And then in the 1990s, late 1990s, I was very bearish about technology stocks in the US and mm -hmm. uh, you know, felt that they would collapse. And so, so many times I identified the markets that were overvalued. At the same time, I was one of the first investors in South Korea and Taiwan in the late 1970s and then in Asia in the early 1980s when markets had become very cheap because we had a boom between 76 and 1980 and after 1980 we had a big decline in most Asian markets until the mid 80s and then in the late 80s I started to travel to Latin America because I felt that there was an undervaluation there due to high inflation so I started to buy Latin American and then I was one of the founding partners of the first Russian fund Firebird in 1993 so to my credit I discovered many markets mm -hmm. and also my book Tomorrow's Gold Asia Age of Discovery is not a bearish book it's bearish about the United States bearish about the world but very bullish about Asia okay. And it was published in 2002, I wrote it in 2001, it was very positive about commodity prices. So, you know, I think investors frequently overlook the fact that there is not, not, not such a thing as a good investment and a bad investment. Mm -hmm. Every asset class, whether it's real estate or stocks or bonds or commodities mm -hmm. or diamonds or precious metals, there's a price at which it is a good investment yep. as a price at which it is a bad investment. That's right. And so one always has to relate everything to what the price is mm -hmm. and at that particular time the price of that asset relative to other prices. For instance, everything could be expensive in the world, but maybe real estate is relatively cheap vis-a-vis -vis equities or maybe commodities are relatively yep. cheap vis-a-vis yep. -vis commodities. And then at other times, commodities and real estate may be relatively expensive vis-a-vis -vis equity. So mm -hmm. we, move, we are in a constantly moving world where there are big changes and in particular the huge changes in terms of relative valuation of assets. Okay. It's like a currency. Sometimes it's overvalued, sometimes it's undervalued. Yeah, yeah. So what's this? I mean, so I, I guess as a, uh, part of this reputation as a contrarian economist is the fact that you seem to be able to predict this. Well, I don't think that anyone can accurately predict anything that is in the future. And we also actually historically know very little about the past mm. because the history of the world has always been uh, written by the victors, you know, the countries that uh, succeeded and not by the countries that were slaughtered. That's true. But uh, it, I think, let's put it this way, I started to work in 1970, so I have some experience, and if I look back at 1970 up to today, mm -hmm. because I'm writing every week and yeah. every month, 
and because I'm giving speeches. Yep. For me, it's easy to see the whole investment environment, 1970 today, going by like a movie in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. you know, what happened in the 70s, we had a huge boom in gold and silver and oil, but the collapse in bond prices. And then in the early 80s, we had a strong dollar and the rise in the stock market mm -hmm. and interest rates coming down and uh, the boom in Taiwan and Japan, and then the collapse in Japan and in Taiwan in the early 1990s, and then the opening of uh, the world, essentially the breakdown of socialism, communism, and so forth. So I mean, it, it yeah. was a very interesting experience, and then by traveling a lot, I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. countries, you know, the way they were, like I came to Kuala Lumpur in 1974 the first time, mm -hmm. Then I see it what it is today. If someone only comes today, it sees a snapshot right. of a country. Right. I've been in Asia that. traveling all the time for mm -hmm. the last uh, 35 years. Yeah. So I have a relatively good impression where a country was 10 years, 20, 30 years ago and today, mm -hmm. and where they might go and where new opportunities rise. Like in Asia, 1950 to 1989, we have exceedingly strong growth in Japan. But after 1970, South Korea and Taiwan have very strong growth until the early 1990s. Yeah. Then comes China, India, Vietnam and so forth. And now in future maybe it's Cambodia, maybe it's Myanmar, maybe it's India, maybe it's uh, Mongolia and so forth. So the centers of economic growth, the economic geography changes all the time. Mm. So in, in, in this regard, you know, what advice would you give uh, our viewers in terms of investments? For this well, the first advice I can give is this. If you cannot tolerate 30% downside volatility mm -hmm. when you buy something, don't even get out of bed in the morning. Okay. Because you understand, we go and buy something today, a house in KL, a house in Singapore, or the stock market and so forth. We could easily go down 30% before it goes up five times. I mean, that, that kind of volatility you have to live with, yeah. and it's courtesy of central banks that print money and keep interest rates mm -hmm. essentially at 0%. Secondly, my advice to investors is what you think mm -hmm. is really irrelevant because you're operating in a market. You are just one participant in the market. There are zillions of other participants and so what you believe is not relevant to what will happen to the market. Mm. So in absence of being able to rely on yourself, I think you have to diversify your assets. You have to have some real estate, you have to have some equities, mm. you have to have some cash, you have to have some precious metals and so forth and so on. But not US government bonds, right? But not US <laughs> government bonds, that for sure. Okay. Although maybe for the next 10 days they rally. Okay. You know, as I said, there will be a lot of volatility. Sure. But uh, in general, I would say you have to diversify. Mm -hmm. And as an advice in life, I think that being uh, living and investing with low leverage, in other words, you don't borrow money. Mm -hmm. You pay cash, mm -hmm. or if you borrow money to buy a house, you borrow little. You live a happier life because you never push to the wall when markets go down, mm -hmm. say you have a house yep. and it's fully paid yep. for, yep. and you paid say half a million, it goes down by 90%. Mm -hmm. If it's fully paid for, you're not happy about it, but it's still the same house in which you live. That's right. But if you buy the house for 500,000 and you borrow 550,000 and it drops 20%, the bank will call you yep. Yep. and take it away from you. Yep. Then you have no money and no house. Yep. You understand? So I think that, uh, my advice to people is really try to go through life with low leverage and low borrowings. Equally, the worst investment you can ever make is to lend money to friends. Okay. At the end, you have the friend, no more, and, and no then, money. And no money. <laughs> That's good advice. You know, one last question. If I'm a 20-year-old just coming out you know, in school, and I want to become like you, I, I, you're, you're my role model, and I yeah, want to become uh, this... You don't, know, this <laughs> don't take me as a role model. <laughs> I want to become this... <laughs> maybe for the nightlife. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> but I want to become this investment yes. guru. Uh, what should I be doing? Uh, and, you know, is there some pieces of advice that you can give me? Well, I mean, you know, I've always uh, lived a life with lots of parties and uh, nightclubs and everything and so forth. 
but I also worked a lot mm -hmm. and uh, I think that I was really a lousy student. I mean, I finished well and so forth, but I never went to university because I was always skiing. And you know, to be in the ski team yep. is extremely demanding on your time, especially okay. if it's a country like Switzerland, where the competition is very tough. So I was never at university. But before my exams, I really, for three quarters of a year, worked, uh, studied 10 hours a day. I mean, late, mm -hmm. not with interruptions for toilets and uh, drinks and so forth, but late. And I believe, you know, there's a time where you work mm -hmm. and it's then funny. you have to spend time on furthering your education by mm -hmm. reading a lot mm -hmm. and by interacting with people who know more than you do. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, ha you need to have people you work with that are better than you are. Yeah. And so you can learn from them and you have to have your own interest. I mean, People say, when do you retire? Uh, why, why should I retire? Do you think I'm going to go and be a gardener or look after my dogs and feed them? For that, I have employees. I'm interested in economics and I'm interested in watching prices go up and down. As in, uh, you know, some people, they watch, uh, some people watch soccer results. Some people watch uh, horse race results. I happen to like to see stocks going up and down and commodities going up and down and bond prices, currencies and so forth. And then analyze why is it happening. When it starts to happen, normally you don't know why. When stocks start to go up, you don't know why. When stocks start to go down, you usually don't know why. But later on, there will be, because the markets, they move ahead of the news. In other words, the markets are a discounting mechanism. Like now, everything looks quite good. Economic recovery in the world, corporate profits are good. But now, maybe stock markets go down. We will not know right away why, mm -hmm. but eventually we'll know why. Okay, very good. Mark, thank you so much for being, my pleasure. With us, being here with us today. And yes. uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, thank you again. We are here live on the Leadernomics Show.